Pro basketball is gearing up for a new season. And though last season didn't turn out as many had hoped for the Toronto Raptors, the last few years have been historically fabulous for the franchise. Basketball writer Doug Smith has been on this beat since day one. And his new book, We the North, 25 Years of the Toronto Raptors, captures that story on the court and beyond. He is the Toronto Star's hoops expert, and he joins us now from Mississauga for more. Doug, so good to see you again. How are you doing, my friend? I'm good, Steve. Good to see you, too. It's been a long time. Well, we're going to walk down all 25 years of memory lane here, <laughs> starting, if we can. Sheldon, bring up the first picture, if you would. November 3rd, 1995, 25 years and a few weeks ago. This is at the Sky Dome, as we then called it. The first ever Raptors game, and you were there. What do you remember from that night? <laughs> It's funny, Steve. You know, the thing I remember most is the national anthem. It How was come? maybe it was maybe four or five days after Quebec referendum that passed what fifty one forty nine in a very contentious time in our country. The bare naked ladies sang the national anthem. They broke into French in the middle stanza, and the crowd cheered. And to me, that was a very Canadian moment. It's going to be the thing that I take away from that night, even more than the basketball. The, the fact that. As a Canadian sports story, that was a very touching moment, and it, it, it stuck with me now for 25 years. I'm getting chills, actually, just thinking about it, as I did when I read that passage in your book. Interesting, though, I thought you might say the Raptors won the game, and yeah. Mighty Mouse became a star. Tell us about him. Right. Damon, Damon Stoudemire was, you know, as you know, Steve, the first face of the franchise, the first first-round draft pick, a little overachieving left-handed guard four years of college, kind of in the same mold as Isaiah Thomas, frankly. And, you know, the fans booed when he was drafted. They wanted a, Ed O'Bannon out of UCLA. But Damon had this kind of will about him that, that he just played hard, would not accept loss as well. And I think Canadian and Toronto sports fans appreciate that in their athletes. And he quickly, he quickly turned the crowd and the fans into his favor because just the way he played, he just played hard and, and wanted to win every night out, despite the fact the team was overmatched talent-wise. I want to ask you about you just for a second here because, and again, we're going to situate this in the time. The Blue Jays are only a, you know, a few years removed from, actually only two years removed from their second World Series victory. The Leafs had a pretty good team at that time. They'd gone deep into the playoffs. There wasn't really all that much interest, apparently, in this new basketball team in terms of reporting. Why did you put your name forward? Well, you're right. There weren't a lot of hands going up when people were asking around who wanted to do this. Um... You know, I had known the game a little bit. I had played at high school and college, knew some guys in the national team program, had had covered the dream team in the 1992 Olympics in Barcelona and uh, in Portland before that. So I appreciated the game. But I also, you know, as a journalist, you want to get in on history. And this was the first franchise that was starting in Canada since, I guess, 1977 in the Blue Jays. And there was a historic nature to it. And to be able to sort of chronicle the, the development and, and the, or the origins of it, that was pretty intriguing as a reporter. And, you know, it, it sort of paid off. It, was, it sort of turned, turned out to be the pretty right decision, I think. Mm -hmm. Plus, I couldn't skate. <laughs> what do you mean? You're Canadian? You can't skate? No, I could not. I cannot skate at all. I'm not... Those 5.30 in the morning, Saturday morning hockey practices were not in my bag. <laughs> okay, good enough. Let's talk about the first major executive that the Raptors brought in to try to turn things around. Isaiah Thomas... He had been a big name from the Detroit Pistons, where he'd won a couple of championships with them. So he's got that championship pedigree. What was his role, in your view, in turning Canada into a basketball-loving country? He, he was the ultimate salesman. He was a gregarious guy. He would go and talk to the service clubs, the, the, the businessmen's organizations to sell the games, sell the tickets, sell the franchise. I think he knew that it was a hard sell because, frankly, it was a, a hockey city. And... He had a very dynamic personality. You know, Isaiah, as a player, was a very tough guy, played on those bad boys Pistons team that won championships. But as a, as a person, he just had this way about getting to people. And, and I think he was a rather inspired hire just for his personality. He was willing to do the work and talk to the right people and convey the right message that this sport was going to work in Toronto and that the force of his personality would help it succeed in a market where, you know, it was touch and go at times, that, that you didn't know whether the, the people were going to accept this new American sport. Well, I was going to ask you, how well did Toronto fans, or, you know, fans for that matter from anywhere who came to the games, how well did they know the game? Oh, not very well at all. They couldn't, 
you know, there were there were parts of the, the technical aspects of the game that were just out of their out of the realm. They, they just didn't quite understand. Them. They got they came to understand them, but the other stuff that shocked them. The, the dance packs, the mascot, the stuffed animals running around, the, the playing of music during the competition was something that was unheard of in, in Canadian sports. And it took a long time, a little, you know, quite a while for the bulk of the fans to go, okay, this is not just a game. This is a, an experience. And the, the basketball fan, it took a little while to get used to that because they were used to going to hockey games where basically you sat on your hands until the team scored and then you cheered or you listen to Stomp and Tom Connor sing. And that was that was the entertainment. You know, basketball was a almost a sensory overload kind of thing. There was always something going on. That's how I was going to put it. It's almost a two hour nonstop assault on your senses, if you like. Now, a lot of people like that. What what did you think of it all? Uh, I knew it was coming. I didn't particularly like it. And it's gotten worse over the years. You know, back if you look at I presume if you watch the ninety five game closely you wouldn't be nearly as inundated with stuff as you are today. Every time out has a contest. Every arena has some screaming in-game host that, that sort of cheer tells the fans when to cheer. I, I, I prefer the basketball as the basketball, but I also understand that in this day and age, especially now, in the way that society is, you need to be entertained every minute. The, the attention span is mostly of gnats, <laughs> and you need to have something going on around you that keeps you up up and occupied so that the game becomes not secondary to the event, but it's just part of a bigger thing. Well, in some respects, you can understand it because the first few years, after all, were pretty terrible. I mean, in the 97-98 season, the team won 16 games and lost 66. Did you they ever did. think at that time about walking away that this just might not be as much fun as you thought it was going to be? Well, I'll tell you, in that year, they won their, they won their, they lost their first two games won their third, and then lost 19 in a row. And I covered every one of those 19 games. <laughs> and I figured if I survived that, I could get through pretty much anything. Because about 12 games into a losing streak, you walk in a locker room, and you got nothing to say, and they got nothing to answer. And as a reporter, that's a really difficult time to, to handle. But, yeah, we knew they were going to take losses, and they weren't going to be good. They were sort of hamstrung by the uh, expansion agreement with the league on what players they could get how much money they could spend. And as, as a journalist, the fun thing was you were telling stories about people as opposed to games. You couldn't write about the game because the games are all the same. Hmm. You, were, you were introducing readers to different personalities and people. And if you stuck it out when they didn't want to talk to you and got good stories out of it, then you knew that uh, things were going to take off. Eventually, they had to get better. And they did, eventually. It took a while, but they did. Well, I wonder if part of the problem was... The Raptors were, unlike in the NHL where there are seven Canadian teams, the Raptors are the one and only Canadian team in a league where everybody else is playing stateside. And I wonder how big a, a selling job it was to try to get players to come up here in the beginning. Oh, you, you would have thought you were asking them to come to Mars. Hmm. They, they didn't want to come here. They had, they had, the metric system was confusing. Their bags of milk, the, the TV was different. They couldn't see their ESPN. Um, the food was different. Their grocery stores were different. There was, it took a lot of sales. They thought they were going into another part of Earth rather than just a, basically an extension of the society they lived in. But yeah, it, Glenn Grumald and Isaiah Thomas, the first executives, had a hard time selling agents on sending their players here, players on coming to live in a city where, you know, people talk about Toronto being cold, but you're also bringing guys from Milwaukee and Detroit and Chicago and, you know, not necessarily balmy uh, neighborhoods, but it was a different country. And there were issues of taxation. There were issues of where you live. There was all kinds of things that took a lot of convincing that, you know, once they got them here, once they got players here, they realized that Toronto's a pretty damn good city. It was very cosmopolitan, very worldly. But the Americans, they thought they were going to some horribly foreign place where they spoke a different language, let alone lived a different lifestyle. I'm blanking on the guy's name now. That, that player who said, my kids, you know, they're in the school system, they don't get this. Uh, his wife had and, a problem with it as well. Who was that? Antonio Davis. Antonio and, Davis. Just, yeah. And it, it, uh, uh, concern about the kids learning the metric system, which, <laughs> okay, uh, wow. You know, just at, at, at some point about a year and a half in, I would just roll my eyes. Oh, come on. This is, let's just, let's just go. Well, things changed uh, rather dramatically when, and how shall we describe this guy? He's sort of half man, half amazing slam dunk artist. 
There is the inimitable Vince Carter. What was his impact on the organization? Well, I, I don't want to say he saved basketball here, but he certainly gave it a legitimacy. All of a sudden, when Vince in that, that 1999, 2000, 2001 era, 2002, he was at that one time one of the top 10 basketball players on earth. And he played for the Toronto Raptors, which gave the Raptors a legitimacy and a profile globally that they never had and, and never would have had had he not been here. Um, he didn't, like I say, I don't think he saved the franchise, but he gave it a stamp. And he was electrifying. You know, we would go on the road and, and people would be at the hotel to get autographs. They would, before the game, they would be sort of stalking the bus. Every game he played, just about every game he played in the 400 and so that I watched him, he did something that made you go, holy crap, <laughs> isn't that something else? And, and I think you know, fans here took to that. He was ours. He, he was Toronto's Vince Carter. And uh, that made the Raptors, it gave him a legitimacy in the sport. Now, I know you two have a good, uh, close relationship. He's, he's done the forward to your book, after all. But having said that, he had a pretty terrible breakup with the franchise. Uh, what happened there? Horrible. I, I, I you know, he, 24 games into the season, he didn't particularly play all that well. I don't think he got as many shots as he was used to. I think the team was pivoting away to a Chris Bosh team as opposed to a Vince Carter team. And he got traded for a bag of donuts. And I think people resented him for what the return for him was. And I, I think he took a little bit of heat unnecessarily. And yeah, it, it didn't end well. But, you know, Steve, when superstars leave teams, it seldom ends well. The, the, mm. the fact that Vince was sort of blamed for his departure was not unusual. I think the vitriol was a little bit over the top and it lasted too long. But yeah, the, he was not blameless in it. But I think the people took it to an extent that they probably shouldn't have. I, I'm sure you were at the game. I was at the game as well, where he came last season to play his final game in Toronto. He's now played more than any player in NBA history. That's astonishing. I, I, you would I, I could have retired betting that 25 years ago. He mm. played 22 years in the NBA. I didn't think he would last 10. Mm. He, he will go down. And there will be no player who plays 22 seasons in the NBA ever again. There's too much money. There's too much wear and tear on their body. The, that person does not exist. I cannot see it happening. Um, and to think that he started here and uh, had the length of his career it, it is incredible to me. And yeah, I, you know, I'm glad that there's a reconciliation between the fans in Toronto and Vince because I think it's important for the his history of the franchise, for the historical look at the franchise, that people understand that, yeah, okay, it didn't end well, but holy crap, what a run it was when he was here. And he got a lovely ovation in his last game in Toronto, yeah. didn't he? Yeah, yeah he, he did. did. And I, and it, it, it's good. It made him, it was a cathartic moment, that, that game where, you know, he, he was brought to tears by the video tribute, and he should have been. I think the fans are very uh, forgiving and a little bit later than they should have been, but I'm glad, I'm glad it happened. Well, there was quite some transition after Vince left, and I'll just mention some of the things here. There was the firing and hiring of Jay Triano, their one and only Canadian coach, Dwayne Casey, uh, the addition of Masai Ujiri in the front office, the drafting of DeMar DeRozan, trading for players like Kyle Lowry and Serge Ibaka. What was, in your view, the kind of signature key moment that turned around the franchise? I, I honestly think it was when they brought you, uh, Mazai back. When you jury, my, Mazai Ujiri came back, Tim Lawicki hired him, I guess, in 2014, maybe it was, 13, 14. That was the moment that Mazai has a strength of character, a strength of a personality that he said, we're going to win in Toronto, and you believed him. Everybody else had said it. But there was something about the way he delivered the message that made people believe. And, you know, he made some very hard decisions over the course of his tenure here. Um, has, you know, he traded DeRozan, who was beloved by the fans and wanted to play his entire life here. He fired Dwayne Casey, who was a tremendous coach and a greater man and was had been here for seven years. So that was not an easy thing to do. But I, there was a, a strength of will to Mazai that you saw right off the bat. And you believed. He was the guy who sat at his introductory news conference next to Tim Lywicki at the time and said, look, I don't want to hear this crap about people that want to come to Toronto. We're going to make it so they want to come to Toronto. And we're going to win here. And you believed him. And I think the fans believed him. And I think the players in the league and agents who run a lot of things believed him. What would you think when at that public event he, he dropped the F-bomb about Brooklyn? <laughs> Typical Mazai. I'm sorry. He, he said that kind of stuff to us privately a hundred times before, but that's just like him. He, he's, he's unfiltered. He is very passionate and he is very 
steadfast that I'm going to win. You know, and that's the thing that, that drives Mazai is winning. And that F Brooklyn thing was classic. It was classic Mazai uh, because that's what he thought and that's what he said. Well, as you point out, one of his toughest calls was getting rid of Dwayne Casey as the coach in 2018. And as you say in the book, they settled. They settled on Nick Nurse. What does that mean? Well, I, I think they there were a lot of other guys in the mix. You know, they they did they they talked very seriously to Mike Budenholzer, who is now the coach in Milwaukee, who had come off a uh, coach of the year performance at Atlanta with the Atlanta Hawks. There was a, there were thoughts that they wanted to go get a big name like a, like a Jeff Van Gundy or or a, a coach of that magnitude who might have been unemployed, a George Carl, that kind of guy. You know, Nick had been an assistant, and he'd been a, you know, a very key assistant to Dwayne. And he had been a head coach in, in Britain and had been a head coach and a coach of the year in the G League or D League, as it was called then. So he had some chops. But the hardest thing for guys to do in basketball is move that one seat to the left on the coaching bench. Because now you're not an assistant. You're the guy making the, the calls and you're doling out playing time and you're dealing with the personalities. When you're an assistant coach, you're the guy that the players go to to complain about the head coach. Mm. Now, if you move over, you know that the guy sitting to your right, your assistant, the players are complaining to him about you because you've been there. And it takes a special guy to be able to handle that move. And I mean, Nick was a bit of a surprise hire. And as it turned out, inspired, but I think a bit of a surprise hire to a lot of people. In terms of tactics and strategy, Casey versus Nurse, big difference? Yeah, I think Nurse is, I think Nick is far more, uh, I, I use the word improvisational. He, he figures stuff out on the fly and is willing to change on the go. Dwayne was a great coach and is a great coach. I think there was a rigidity to him that, that probably didn't work in the end. He did the same thing and he got the players to try to do the same thing all the time. With Nick, if things not working, he'll change stuff in the middle of the third quarter. And he might try stuff that's off the wall. Boxing one in the NBA Finals, for instance playing two small guards and Kyle Lowry and, and Fred Van Vliet at the same time for big time minutes together. That's sort of unconventional thinking. And, and I think that's the kind of thing that he was drawn, that Masai Ujiri was drawn to when he hired him was his ability to adapt and admit that, okay, my way's not working. Let's try another way. And as it turned out, I think that's his greatest strength. And we've seen it in the two years he's been head coach. Hmm. Doug, we're going to show a clip here. And this really does... This is one of the reasons we love sports, because we're going to show two different shots happening here, both against the Philadelphia 76ers. You know where I'm going with this. And they are mirror images of one another, but boy, oh boy, one was the agony and one was the ecstasy. Sheldon, if you would, let's roll it. Carter trying to get free. Carter at the buzzer. No good. And the Sixers hold on and advance to the conference finals. Top. Looks at the clock, turns the corner for the win. Go down! Kawhi Leonard with the game winner! <laughs> We've all probably seen that Kawhi Leonard shot hundreds of times since then, and Every time that ball goes up, I still wonder if it's going to go in. Because <laughs> four bounces, Doug, four bounces. What did you think when you saw it? Well, I, I, well, the first reaction was, holy crap. I can't <laughs> believe what I just saw. Then it was, how am I going to write this? Because I got to do it like right now. But it, it, it was fascinating. But Steve, you're absolutely right. It, it, it is the beauty and the essence of sport in, those, in that minute. Two un, you know, wonderful shots. One didn't go in. One went in. If it happened the other way around, who knows? Like if Vince's shot goes in, it changes the course of Raptors history, without question. If Kawhi's shot goes out, it changes the course a different way of Raptors history. It, it, it's a fascinating glimpse at what sports is. And I'm so glad. I was one of the few guys who was in the arena for both of those shots. And they both give me goosebumps to this moment. I watched that clip, and in the Vince shot, I got goosebumps. In yep. the Kawhi shot, I still do. It, it's the beauty of the game. And I just, I just love it. We do have to remember that even when Kawhi sunk that shot, that was just the second round. They still had two more rounds to go before winning. And I want to know, honestly now, your hand on a Bible, 
Did you think at the beginning of the playoffs that the Raptors could take it all in 2019? No, I, I did not. I, I thought I thought Philly might get them. I thought Milwaukee was pretty good, but I thought Philly was a tough. And I didn't think they could beat Golden State if they got to the NBA Finals. It, it, that would have been unfathomable to me. I, I thought they were good. I, well, I knew they were a good team, but to win a championship, it, it takes so much so much luck, so much break, so many good things have to happen. I, you talk, Steve. I, you know, after that Philly series, they played Milwaukee. They were down two nothing in the series, playing Game Three at home. Kyle Lowry follows out with five minutes to go in the fourth quarter. They play two overtime periods without him, plus the five minutes of the game. Pascal Siakam missed a couple of clutch free throws that would have saw, saved the game in the first overtime. If they lose that game, they're out of it. They're down 3 nothing in a conference, conference final, and it's over. So that's the kind of thing that when you start a playoff run, you don't know what's going to happen, but you need, you need a break. And you need a, bad, a good break for you and a bad break for the other guys. And, and so, no, I did not think they would win a championship when those playoffs started. Doug, why were you not at the victory parade? Uh, well, me and the people don't really get along, and two million of them is way too many for me. <laughs> I I, tr I actually tried to go. I got to the GO station out here in Mississauga, and I think four or six trains went past me that I could not get on because they were too full, and it was like 7 o'clock in the morning. And at that point, I thought, there's no way. There's no chance I'm going to get anywhere that I can do my job. Plus, it was, it was a moment for the people. I, I tell you the truth, I went and sat in my bar and watched it on TV for seven hours, and I had a great time. And, and, and sort of reveled in the, the glory of it privately as opposed to with two million not-so-close friends. <laughs> now, uh, I saw a nice picture of you there with the Larry OB, <laughs> but, but even you in your heart of hearts have to acknowledge the Stanley Cup is a prettier trophy than the Larry OB, isn't it? Yeah, I think it probably is. Okay. Probably, mostly because I grew up in the first 60 years of my life looking at the Stanley Cup. But, yeah, yeah it, it's a more aesthetically pleasing-looking trophy. Yes. Okay, good. On this, we agree. I want to read an observation that you made here in your book, and it goes like this. White, black, brown, male, female, transgender, non-binary, old, young, somewhere in between, rich and poor, famous and anonymous, that was the crowd and that was my Canada. It has been the tale of the franchise as well. The story of the Raptors is not only the story of the evolution of a sport and a team, but of a fan base, a society, a country. What do you think, Doug, distinguishes the Raptors from all the other teams in the NBA? I think they, they reach a group of people um, that is far more diverse and far more different than grew up watching hockey. I, the Raptor fans of a certain age, 40-year-olds, 30-year-olds, they didn't grow up watching Saturday night hockey games with their dad. They maybe came from another country where basketball was a, was a big deal. And they came to Toronto and they were able to cheer for their own team. And I think that's, you know, if you look 25 years ago, the kids who were going to games were from Asia, Africa, Europe, South America. They, they, were, new, they were new to Canada and new to the sport and had their own team. And if they were 15 years old or 10 years old growing up then, now they're 35 and 40 and they're the band base. And I think that's a hugely significant part of what the Raptors have been involved in, in the evolution of not only basketball, but of Canada and of Toronto and Southern Ontario. And the country, our city, the area looks different now than it looked in 1995. And the Raptors are far more representative of that in their fan base and the way they try to attract people. They, they go out and seek fans from other nations who might be new Canadians. And, and it's paid off for them hugely. We've got a minute left here, and I want to ask you, Doug, the hardest question of all at the end, and that is, <laughs> I need your Mount Rushmore of Raptor players. You've seen every single player who ever put a uniform on play for this team. I want the all-time center, the all-time two best forwards, and the all-time two best guards. Go. Okay, I'm going to go with Kyle Lowry, DeMar DeRozan, Vince Carter, Chris Bosh, and I, you know, Antonio Davis wasn't a center, but I just loved the way he played, so I would put him and Jonas Valanciunas in a tie as the Mount Rushmore of positional players. Guys, as people, there's a different group. But as if I had to start a five-man group in the NBA today, that would be my five Raptors. Now, what's interesting about that list is, you know, the, the, the two forwards and the two guards, phenomenal. The Raptors have never really had a singularly phenomenal center. They've never had a Will Chamberlain. They've never had a Bill Russell. No. And yet, right, they won anyway. 
they won a championship. Exactly. Marcus Solf could probably be on that team. And he played here, what, a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now he's gone. Yeah, that's exactly. It's the way it is. All right. How far is this team going this year? I think they got a shooter's chance to win the East. They'll be in that top four group with like uh, Brooklyn, Philly, uh, Milwaukee, Boston, Miami, and that top four, top five. And like two years ago, they'll get to the playoffs and stuff will happen, good or bad, and they might have a shot to win it. <laughs> well, as is always the wonderful thing about sports, we shall see. Absolutely. Doug, it's so good to have you on the program. We the North, 25 years of the Toronto Raptors. Uh, enjoy the upcoming season as much as you can, given that they're playing in Tampa and you're not going to get to any games, are you? Probably not. Although there's a hope they'll be back in March if things change, but things change hourly, hourly so who knows? Fingers crossed. Good to see you again, Doug. Great to see you. Take care. Great to see you too. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.